to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there from Ireland. How are you all? How was your Halloween? Did you all have a good night? It was my birthday, so thank you for all the kind birthday wishes I received. Anyway, welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the Mighty Kraken, the best place to buy and sell Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got something pretty special. I've got a rare interview with Nick Zabo. But before that, let's hear from my amazing sponsors. So first up, have you checked out my new sponsor, Why yet? You should do. They are absolutely crushing it. They are helping companies across the space offer Bitcoin onboarding. So whether you are a solo developer or a large team, if you are looking to simplify the user onboarding process, if you looked into this and you're struggling with it, you want to offer your users an easy, fast way to purchase Bitcoin, then you really need to get on the phone and talk to Wire. Since 2013, they have focused on taking care of the heavy lifting in terms of compliance, payments and liquidity, so you can focus on building your core offering. Your idea could be the next killer app, so don't let the regulators kill it. To find out more, reach out to Wire or create a developer account at sendwire.com, which is S-E-N-D-W-Y-R-E.com. Also, today's show is brought to you by the amazing Dropbit, my favorite mobile Bitcoin wallet, and they've been crushing it with all their announcements recently. Not only have they added lightning payments, but they've also offered support for Betch32 addresses, And they've got another new thing coming very, very soon, which I'm also very excited to tell you about. There is nonstop innovation from Dropbit. They've crushed the UX. They've got all these cool features like tweeting Bitcoin to people and texting Bitcoin to people. And as I said, they've also added Lightning. If you're on the waiting list and you're trying to get access, do reach out to me on Twitter. I will get back to you eventually. Anyway, it's available for the iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. Okay, so onto the show, and it doesn't really get much bigger than Nick Zabo, right? So I have this list of guests that I'm trying to target, and Nick has been top of it. And you know, as hard as I try and get people, I didn't ever think or didn't know if I'd ever get Nick on. So to eventually have made this interview happen, I'm really grateful to Nick. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Nick. There are so many things you can discuss with Nick, but the things I was really keen to cover was finding out more about Bitcoin, the proposal Nick put forward, which predates Bitcoin, and some see as a direct precursor to Bitcoin. But I also really wanted to get into the cypherpunk stuff. I wanted to find out more about the movement, what he believed they achieved, what the direct successes were. And of course, we also get into Bitcoin. We talk about the early days through to what Nick's opinions are on it now and where it's heading. So I can't thank Nick enough for coming on the show. I know you'll love this one. I know everyone will love this one. So thank you, Nick, for coming on. And I hopefully I'll get to do this again with him sometime in the future. And just a couple of notes. I'm back off to bed for today. I'm planning my next trip out soon. We'll probably include Boston, New York, San Fran, LA, Hawaii, and New Zealand. That's where I think I'm going to be heading. As soon as I know more, I'll let you know. Lots more cool interviews planned. Anyway, any questions about the interview, do reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Good afternoon, Nick. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for doing this. I know you don't do many interviews. Actually, I found two interviews. Obviously, the Tim Ferriss interview with Naval, which was great, and there was another one on YouTube, but you don't do many. It's so, uncommon. Yeah, I feel very proud to get this. People are going to lose their shit. Thank you. I've never figured out what your actual career goals are, what what is a peak for you, but uh, I'll embarrass you a little bit now. I've got a list of target guests, mm-hmm. and I had three that I like were right at the top, and two I hadn't got. I'm not going to name the other one to embarrass, but you're up there. So okay. I've now gone peak and a nick. Wonderful. And we've got a couple of people to thank, but I'm not going to thank them publicly, because what will happen after this is people will pest them, say, <laughs> get Nick to come on my podcast. Well, we've got a lot to cover. Actually, do you remember when I tried to bait you into an interview online? Oh, uh, that happens a fair amount, so I, I, I had no, no fair member specifically. Well, you might do. So you didn't follow me, but we had a little back and forth about something, and I tried to reel you in. I said, mm-hmm. I've got a question for you. What have Diffy, Back, Todd, and Chow got in common? Mm-hmm. And you said to me, I don't know. Let me know. And I went, they've all been a guest on my podcast. How do I get you in that list? Ah. About four hours went by. There was no reply, but lots of people were tweeting, retweeting. It was all going crazy. I was actually on a flight. I got off the flight, and I was like, finally, I got an alert saying Nick Zabo has replied. And you just said, no. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> like, like a dagger. No, online can be uh, abrupt. It can be brutal. But we, uh, we got in. Sorry man. about that. <laughs> so listen, I've noticed, uh, I noticed over the last few months you've been tweeting a lot more about Bitcoin. It seems like, I don't know what you were doing previously, but it seems like you've come really back into Bitcoin, getting quite heavily interested in writing about it again. Is that a fair observation? I think it's more grown over me over the last few years that 
culture is more important. These things are trust minimized. They're not trustless. And so, you know, what the people believe who do the coding and run the exchanges and do the mining and so forth, the influential people who are in the full nodes, what they believe is important. And it's not what in the Bitcoin ethos, what most people believe about trust and related issues like that. So I've realized that it's pretty special what Bitcoin has. It's not being replicated over the vast majority of other coins. And that to me is what, what's giving it a lot of its staying power. And you feel like that some people are getting some things wrong. It's important just to lay some kind of foundational. Right. right. So you must be self-aware that people really look up to you in this and really respect what you say. Many do, many don't. <laughs> it depends where they're coming from. Certainly in the blockchain space in total, there's, there's lots of people who are newer to the space, came in because of the, the money that uh, do not share these uh, values. Yeah, I, I could be put into one of those, so I apologize. I'm, an, I'm only like a two and a half year old veteran of this. Well, I mean, there's new people that do share the values too, so it, it, oh, well, I try it, there's to. all kinds. I did, um, I did uh, troll you once as well, where you talked about the saving for you four years and it's not Lambos. And I was like, well, I've got a four-year Lambo goal. And you forgave me. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to block me for it. No, 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 that's great. I've always fun with this stuff. So so there's loads. <laughs> there's so much to talk about. And I'm conscious like people are really going to want to hear from you. And I expect, and I kind of hope also selfishly, that you don't do another interview for a while. So I, I want to get as much out of this as I can. I want to find out some of your views on Bitcoin, but I want to find out a bit more about you, Nick. I think... You can come across a bit grumpy online, but in person oh, yeah. you are. You've got like you've done nothing but smile since you've been here. Right. I've listened to the Tim Ferriss interview again. You were cracking up all the way through. So I know you're not just a, a, a grumpy blockchain Bitcoin guy. So let's get into this. So it would be great to know a bit about your education and what it was about the education that led you into this interest. And I'm going to say it's there seems to be both money and smart contracts. What is it that took you on this journey? So I had a computer science education and fairly broad splash of reading along with that, everything from history to science fiction to uh, all sorts of both creative things and, and things that get you in touch with, with how people lived over a longer span than, than our current culture. What kind of things were you noticing with that, though? What are the standout trends? That you, is, was money just a very obvious trend within that? Yeah, so I mean, economics is part of that, but also going beyond that and realizing how important security is in history, for example. You know, it's, I mean, there's parts of history that are just about wars and that's about all it's about. And that's exaggerated in one direction, but economics is exaggerated in another direction where, you know, you assume everything's secure, you assume property rights are secure, and you start from there. And I mean, those are both very narrow views of the world and to understand money, you have to understand both of those really. Okay, so let's dive into them. What what are the key things you need to understand about economics and security with regards to the money? Oh, I mean, tons of things. I don't know where to get started with well, that. But I, you know, I'm, this will be a you know, I'm an open book. Mm. You know, I'm always learning, and I learn from my guests. And if I'm going to learn about money, it seems to be that Nick Zabo is the guy to learn about money from. Okay, well, I mean, to think about how society is structured for those of who understand protocol layers, you can think of it as protocol layers. For those who understand architecture, you know, you start with a foundation, then you build some structure on the foundation, then you've got, you know, drywall, your paint, and your windows. So you have various layers to your architecture. And then computer architecture and computer protocol architecture is the same. A lot of things in life are the same. They have these layers. Well, you can think of society that way as well. Uh -huh. And really at the base layer, I mean, there's material needs, but there's also security. And the two basic things you'll study in law school and also libertarian ideology, which has been an influence on me, are uh, property and contracts. And those are kind of the two basic economic things that law secures that are prerequisite to things like economics working or the assumptions starting to make sense in economics. How far down that libertarian rabbit hole do you go? Because it's a new thing to me that I became aware of with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd heard of it. But it's only because I've become aware of Bitcoin over the last couple of years and I've met lots of the kind of radical libertarians, everyone from Eric Voorhees to Safety in the Moose. And, and mm -hmm. I struggle to go full anarchist libertarian and imagine a society which is stateless. I just really struggle 
I understand the argument, but I struggle with it. And I struggle with the rule of law in that mm. kind of view of the world they have. Where where do you sit in this? I mean, for me, it's a great ideal. It's one of these achievable, unachievable, and full probably ideals like trustlessness or you know other other you know end state things. But it's something you can strive for because I mean, government does a lot of nasty things. If you look at legal procedure, it's based on coercion, putting people in jail, arresting them, which if you weren't a police officer would be called kidnapping, and so forth. Taxation, which if you weren't the tax collector would be called theft. Mm -hmm. So it's based on things that other people don't get to do. And so it's like this exception to what everybody else is expected to do, basically. You'd like to improve on that. It's not the moral endpoint of humanity, probably. But you've also studied humans. And by the way, if uh, <laughs> this is where a little bit of influence you've had on me. Let me show you this. Yeah, look what I'm on my Audible right now. So I'm doing the selfish gene. Ah, okay. Yes, that yeah. was a big influence on me as well. Yeah, well, so that came up in the Ferris interview. So, But when you look at humans and the study you've done of humans, uh, so one of the things I've always thought is like, you know, if you look at tribes or you look at even look at animals, there's like this natural thing that animals or humans want to organize themselves. Mm. They, they build structures. So isn't it natural that we do build structures and we do have something like a police force? Like if we ignore the fact that most of them are shit, but imagine we had just theoretically a good police force. Wouldn't it be a good thing to have a group that we all pay into that can ensure that law is followed and that we are protected? Well, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, that's been structured in various ways throughout history. The modern police forces didn't really come about until 18th and 19th centuries for the most part. I mean, you had certain kinds of course of, legal procedures before that, they were still coercive, but they were rather different than having a police force. So these things evolve and they change around, but uh, nobody's figured out how to eliminate coercion out of, no, we have figured out how to eliminate coercion out of money, at least the issuing of money. Yep. So, you know, one, one thing at a time. <laughs> one thing at a time, yeah. And, so uh, and it's, not, it's not a given that all the rest of it is possible, but it's an interesting ideal to think about. It gets the creative juices flowing to think about a society without government. It's not like it's actually achievable here in our lifetimes or anything like that, like you know, a lot of the more into it anarcho capitalists would argue. But there's a lot of different creative ideas from different points of view, and that's certainly one of them. Well, so Eric Voorhees said it to me quite interestingly. He said it shouldn't be that we target no government. We shouldn't be targeting that. The target should just be less government. That's that's mm -hmm. a goal we can walk towards. Right. And that's something we can achieve and we can measure. Mm -hmm. Right. But the inter one of the interesting things about cryptocurrency is we started at the security layer. We, uh, we reinvented money from the ground up. Instead of taking the economist's view that we're going to, you know, alter the money supply or we're going to have our own bank and issue it our own way. It's more ground up. It's starting with security and really focused on security. And that's part of what makes it globally seamless, for example. Like it doesn't depend on, on nation states and laws and that kind of thing. And is Bitcoin completely coercion free? Well, the use isn't. I mean, obviously, there's some uses of it that involve coercion. But the issuance of it and, and stuff, it doesn't depend on the legal system. No. But I notice, obviously, like certain addresses have been put on sanctioned lists, for example. Would you consider that? coercion yeah certainly but i mean it depends how much people are actually coerced into respecting that and mm. i mean that's an interesting issue to to look at empirically to see how well that actually works yeah i guess so money's always been something that you've seemed to have had taken great interest in right mm. and like you say this is a good starting point for trying to take some coercion away from government mm -hmm. so we're going to have to then dive straight into like the money side of Bitcoin. Can, can we do a bit of the background on money? I know you've talked about it plenty of times before, but a lot of people who listen to my show wouldn't have heard you talk about the history of money and what, even, what money means. Can, can we go into that a little bit? Um, sure. So, um, I mean, as part of, of coming up with Bitgold, kind of in parallel with that, I was doing research on the history of money and working my way backwards. Part of the history of money was the private banking where private banks would issue money, um, IOUs, banknotes. And George Selzin and Larry White were uh, the main people I read on that one. And uh, that was inspiring, but then you read later how it failed and how it got usurped by central banks. And then the, later on, maybe 100, 200 years later, then the central banks get turned into fiat currency, 
like people used gold coins themselves, gold and silver, actually silver more than gold. Then they changed using banknotes that were redeemable in gold because gold was still the money people wanted. So at the end of the day, you wanted to be able to go to that gold window and get that gold out. And so what interested me was that people like David Chaum and so forth had already solved the, the IOU problem. Like you can do that digitally as long as, you know, have a central party issue an IOU and then redeem it for something. But what they hadn't solved is the gold part of it. And that's really the trust minimized part of it. And there's, I don't know how explicit it is, but kind of implicit in academic cryptography and a lot of work in cryptography is that, well, I don't even know if it's implicit, but a trusted third party is kind of when you give up and say, you know, I can't do anymore, so we're going to trust this person with this function because we don't know how to do this with a security protocol. And so, for example, certificate authorities and public key cryptography, the main way it's done is through certificate authorities and their mm -hmm. trusted third parties. Which are security holes. Which are security holes, yeah. right. I've been listening. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's that. they become the bottleneck in the system and the place you can attack politically or as an activist or as a hacker and bring down the system So or, or alter it to, to suit your political needs, which aren't necessarily the needs of the people using the system. Right. So that was kind of the unsolved problem was how to do that in a distributed or without the trusted third party or without at least a singular trusted third party, reduce the amount of trust involved, the amount of vulnerability involved. So that's why you started work on BitGold? Yeah. So let me ask you about BitGold. Like, so look at Bitcoin now. Obviously, mm. it's a, it is essentially a global currency. I know it's in a perpetual beta, but in some ways I say, I mean, it's, it's already succeeding in many ways. The fact that I, I use it now, I invoice mm. clients and I spend Bitcoin, to me says that, that it's worked. Mm -hmm. It could fail in the future, but that doesn't mean it hasn't worked now. Right. It is this amazing success. When you started work on Bitgold, did you envisage something like that? Were you envisaging the creation of something that could be a global money? Or was it just, were you more envisaging, can I just create something that has the functions that you would want? Do you understand the question? Well, sure. I mean, I didn't understand all the ramifications that come along with having it succeed on a global scale like it has. I was pretty focused on, certainly, I didn't want it to be dependent on government, and that perhaps was more for ideological reason, and creative reasons at that point than for realizing the value of global seamlessness, which is really what, what gives it its value today. Anyway, so certainly all the ramifications that come along with it being success, I didn't most of those I didn't imagine, but um, see, I certainly we, didn't want it to be dependent on the nation state. And implicit with that is that, you know, it could be global. But was your goal with Bitgold, was it a project to test functionality and an idea? Or was it the big dream to create a global currency? Did you actually think that was possible? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was possible. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend a lot of time yeah. working on it. But I didn't rank the probability of it actually going anywhere Hi. <laughs> so, so what happened with Bitgold? What? Because you never got to coding, right? Mm -hmm. What happened? Why? Why? Why didn't you? Well, I mean, it? that's part of it. Is that it was certainly a way out there fringe idea at the at the time I was working on it, and uh, there was only a handful of people in the world I could talk to about it that would even have any clue what I was talking. And and we we were on a mailing list, so there was Cypherpunk's yeah. mailing list, and then myself and Away Die and Hal Finney. And Larry White and George Selgin and a few others were on a mailing list I created called LibTech. And that's where yeah. I came up with Bitgold and Weidai came up with B-Money. And we had great discussions on there. So a lot of that was that kind of creative ferment. And part of that is due to the internet. The internet was fairly you know, new at that time. And you could find people. First of all, not everybody was on the internet. So it was easier to find your, mm -hmm. your fellow spirits, as it were, on the internet. And once you did, you, know, you never would have found them in your own neighborhood or at the school you went to, your classmates or something. This is something the internet created was this finding your, your fellow spirits that, you know, shared your kind of politics, creative strategy, computer science, that, that kind of improbable combination that was needed to come up with this stuff. What came first? Did the cypherpunk group originate before this? Yeah, yeah. Like that originated before? Right. So there was the invention or reinvention, as it turns out, of public key cryptography. You're mm -hmm. making it public in the late 1970s, and that was Ralph Merkel and yep. Whit Diffie and so forth. Then out of that, that inspired David Chaum, and he created this cryptography, academic cryptography group. They played various games to 
try to get it so they could do this publicly because previously it had been classified secret stuff. And I guess the NSA and so forth are not too happy necessarily about this going public. But it went public, and so you had this academic cryptography stuff. So that was in the late 70s, early 1980s. And then in about uh, 1990 or so, Tim May and Eric Hughes and John Gilmore got together and started the cypherpunks movement. Mm -hmm. And that was just to popularize this further, get hackers interested, not just academics interested in it, but hackers, people like Phil Zimmerman, who wrote PGP. Mm -hmm. Hal Finney wrote some remailers based on David Chaum's ideas that later those ideas turned into Tor, for example, digital mix ideas. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so it was a great, great ferment in the early 90s. And How did you hear about them? So I was part of a, this is my science fiction connection. I was yeah, part of a, like a, a, a libertarian futurist group that have all sorts of interesting creative ideas. Nice. And uh, those overlap to some extent with the cypherpunks. So then I found Tim A and got introduced to the cypherpunks and so forth. Was it like a secret Oh, and, and Phil Ferraring is, I think, the person who introduced me also. Right. Is it was it like a secret group? Like was it a public group? How no, did, no, how did no. it work? Did it, you... was, it was public a lot. I mean, you would have had to read the right magazines and articles or be on the right place on the internet to know about it, but but you know, if you turned up, could anyone just turn up and join in or was it, you know, cuz more or less, but it, I mean, it had an ethos and Yeah. And the ethos being now. So there was kind of two factions of cypherpunks. One of yep. them was a you know, the libertarian yes. futurist faction that wanted private money and to privatize things and so forth. And uh, the other one was privacy and that David Chaum and, and so forth. They wanted to take the institutions we have currently like fiat currency, but do them so people can transact privately. Okay. And how often did you meet? I'm trying to imagine it. It just sounds like a really fucking cool thing to be part of. Though. Yeah. Well, we had a mailing list that yeah. you could contribute to. So that was the main medium of communication. And then... Monthly meetings in Silicon Valley, but obviously if you had to be in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Were well, you those, going to those? More or less, half of them maybe. More or less. And did it feel like some rebel movement that was <laughs> taken on the world, right? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Because, I mean, a few years before, or at least a decade before, this has been, you know, secret NSA stuff. Yeah. And here we were writing code and open source and anybody could use it. So what's the state of the cypherpunk movement now? Because I see people on Twitter say they're a cypherpunk, but I'm not aware of it as a group like what you had before with an agenda and a goal. Is it more of like a, an identity now or is there still a group? Well, there's probably people out there marketing themselves as cypherpunk. I would be highly skeptical of people using that, yeah. <laughs> that thing at this point because it was that kind of, I mean, the ethos is still around, but it's scattered into lots of different, groups of which, you know, cryptocurrency is just one of the spin-offs. Did it break up as a group though? I mean, I haven't kept up with it. The, like, right, the list, yeah. for yeah, example, yeah. some of them passed away, unfortunately. Tim. And, yeah, 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 Tim and Halfini. So, yeah, but I mean, Julian Assange was a spin-off yeah. of the Cypherpunks. Tor was a spin-off of the Cypherpunks. BitTorrent was a spin-off of the Cypherpunks. And uh, Bitcoin, so. Oh, and US New Radio, uh, uh, Software-defined radio was a spinoff of the cypherpunks. Okay, so yep. once you said, I don't know that. Uh, okay, so that's that's basically taking some of the lower-level functions in the radio and doing them in software instead of hardware. Okay. And then you can do all sorts of creative things using bandwidth, spread spectrum, all sorts of creative things with the radio. Okay, interesting. Well, I'll look into that as well. But So do you think they were successful, the cypherpunks? Do you think they achieved what they set out to achieve? or They haven't really haven't achieved the privacy thing because computers with Moore's Law have moved so fast... And these corporations with their surveillance and Facebook tracking everything you do with them and lots of things you do off. off Google, di Google diary <laughs> invites. Right. <Or> Google. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's everywhere. So, yeah. yes, there's uh, lots of, even if you use all the cypherpunk tools and use, you know, Zcash and Monero, there's lots of data leaks and it's very hard to, to keep privacy. Do you think it's, full privacy is achievable? It's it's an arms race, and so far it's m partly winning, but mostly losing at this point, unfortunately. Would you even trust a corporation to offer better privacy? So, for example, when I spoke to Ricardo Fluffy Pony from Monero, he said privacy will probably best come from somebody like Apple, who make it a competitive tool. And you know, and I know it sounds a bit weird because obviously they can track you and such, but do you think there'll ever come a time where that's that's better than no privacy? Well. I'm not 
familiar with Apple in particular's track record. There's certainly a lot of other companies that have promised that and failed. So, you know, they've gotten hacked or yeah. things leak out, embarrassing things leak out about people. I saw one today on Twitter, actually. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, trusted third parties or security holes certainly applies in that that case as well. These are a bunch of strangers you're trusting with intimate data. Seems hazardous to me. That, uh, tr- that trusted third party or security holes, that's your thing now, right? It's going to be on your... It's going to be on your grave. On um, my gravestone, yeah. You're going to have the dis- distributed The body. hospital was a security hole. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially you feel like they, I don't want to say failed, but didn't, because that sounds like they didn't do anything. It just, they didn't achieve what they set out to achieve with privacy. The cypherpunks. Yeah, mostly not. I mean, for example, if you go on fast track or these toll paying systems, you know, very few of them have, next to none of them have the strong privacy features that David Chaum wanted to to add, for example. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a there's an understandable trade-off between integrity and privacy. We've seen that with Zcash, where they had some bugs that could have risked inflating their money supply. Mm-hmm. And the bug is based on, well, it's harder to audit because you've got these privacy features. Of course, yeah. And so a lot, most corporations are going to err on the side of, we want to see things and control things. And so they don't, they tend to be negative on the privacy features. Mm. What do you think the things, the biggest achievements were then from the cypherpunks? I mean, monetarily, certainly Bitcoin okay. is the biggest achievement. But, you know, WikiLeaks was certainly influential. BitTorrent was a big success. So, yeah, there's a lot of interesting, successful things that have come out of it. So I did speak to two people for this interview and let them know I'm speaking to you because they're people who I respect and I talk to a lot. And one of them's, um, do you know Matt O'Dell? Um, not personally, but you know of him, yeah. uh, of him, yeah. So he's he he had a question for you that I'm, I'm going to allow him to. So okay. he said because I, I I'm not going to frame it like I know what he's asking, but he said, "What was it like during the encryption export wars of the '90s? What has changed and has the war ended?" Well, it's still going on. The Attorney General the other day was talking about that issue. So and you know back to, well, there's two issues. One is the export issue. The other is the back door issue, but they're both related. Well, I mean, should we do the background both. of what he's actually asking? Because I'm not aware oh, okay. of Okay, so, so one of the issues is simply export control. Like, this is a U.S. technology. We don't want U.S.'s enemies getting it. Mm-hmm. And then the ciphering said, no, this is a free speech issue. I can wear this on my T-shirt. I can print it in a book. This is speech, and it's not a weapon to be controlled. And that's mostly been successful. I, you know, People use cryptography and open source all the time right now. The other one is backdoors and encryption. And that, again, the cypherpunks have mostly been successful in that. There's not a lot of cryptography right now that has that. I mean, they're corporate backdoors, and you know, like you're trusting a VPN and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But, but in terms of government man- mandated, most of the world does not have government mandated backdoors. But, you know, they're, they're still trying to do that after all these years. So. <laughs> I just want to ask something about PGP as well. So I first became aware of PGP when I first discovered the Silk Road. Mm. and it was something I had to use for it. I found it really difficult to use, personally, because I'm not highly technical. Mm-hmm. Do, well, how do you feel about the trade-off between usability and some of these tools? Like, for example, Bitcoin can be complex mm-hmm. for some people to use. I've been a proponent for improving UX, but some people have said, well, when you improve the UX, you risk security. How do you feel about the trade-off between UX and security? Yeah, so we've seen that with Casa Hodel. They... Uh erred on the side of, of making it user-friendly and had some controversial, arguably insecure features in their, their entry-level product. They've got mm-hmm. at least two products. One of them is more sophisticated, more secure, and one of them's entry-level, where they erred on the side of, according to some people, at least too much, on the side of uh, user-friendliness and, and has some possibly questionable security. Yeah, that trade-off there and that, that whole debate over the Casa Hotel product is a good, good recent example of it. But how do you feel about it? Do you feel like there should be a pursuit of better euros? What I'm getting at is that a lot of these tools you talk about, they're they're good f- for humanity, right? Bitcoin mm-hmm. is good for people. Yeah. Privacy is good for people. But most people I know would, would struggle to use PGP, struggle to use Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Therefore, do you think there should be an objective goal to st- strive to make these tools easier so everyone can use it? Or do you think the goal should be just to make the tools available so the techies can actually implement things to help everyone so what i so i'm I'm wording this badly but for example when people talk about bitcoin 
some people talk about it as a tool for everyone. Other people talk about it as separating money from state. Mm -hmm. So if the goal is to separate money from state, do we have to w worry less about UX and more about the fact that it just grows so we can swallow up the state? Yeah, I mean, it depends what part of the system you're talking about. If you're talking about layer one, so for example, increasing the block size would make it friendlier in the sense of lower fees and mm -hmm. probably allow you to make some user-friendly trade-offs better too. But it comes at the cost of trust minimization and security. And so there I say I'm going to err very much on the side of trust minimization and security on, when it comes to layer one and the core functionality. When it comes to the edges, like wallets and so forth, and Casa Hotel's entry system, then you know the lower the value at risk, then the less security you need. So uh, you're going to end up, you know, if you're just buying a cup of coffee, you do not need, you know, the super strong security. I have to validate all the transactions in the world for myself mm -hmm. that you would need for higher value. Uh, transactions. So that's an interesting point also because one of the areas I've clashed with a couple of people on with regards to Lightning is that right now, and I'm really going to piss some people off by saying this, the experience of custodial Lightning wallets is far superior than non-custodial. Mm -hmm. And so, But for me, I'm like, well, I'm only keeping $20, $30 in one. Should I really care? People rightly say, well, that's not the ethos of Bitcoin. The ethos of Bitcoin is non-custodial, own your private keys, blah, blah, blah. It's a tough issue. But yeah. again, I think that ethos is most important in the core and the layer one. Mm -hmm. And as you get out in the layer two and so forth and the lesser values, then then it's more reasonable to, to start trading that off a little bit for user friendliness. All right. Well, listen, I'm going to want to talk to you a bit more about Bitcoin now. We're just going to get straight into it. And interesting, though, I noticed something when I was reading the BitGold white paper and then the Bitcoin white paper. You were very much, with Bitgold, you were very much consider it more like a reserve currency. Mm. And the Bitcoin white paper is very much talks about a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash for, for mm. commerce. So th there was there's that distinct difference between the two of them. But it seems quite interesting that what's happened with Bitcoin, it seems to have evolved into what your vision was for Bitgold, which is a reserve currency. A lot of people talk about that. And it's more that, the say, the Bcash people tend to now talk about a peer-to-peer -peer currency. Mm. Where are you on the whole digital code versus medium exchange for Bitcoin? Well, I mean, it's nice to uh, hype and wish about, you know, everybody could run a full node and be fully scalable and all that. In reality, it's, it's not. If you want to have a trust-minimized system, it's not going to be computationally scalable. It will be socially scalable, which I know this is a, a, a vaguer topic, but it's social scalability is more important than computational scalability. If you want to be globally seamless, if you want to have that really valuable and not just for ideological reasons or even for ideological reasons, but just because globally seamless, trust minimized, not having to go file a lawsuit to get your money back, that kind of thing is just incredibly valuable. It just eliminates so much cost and risk out of the system. So you really want to have that. And it's it's not really something that it's worthwhile compromising on because once you compromise in that direction, you may gain a few bits here and there, increase your transactions per second, but it comes at a much, much higher cost, which is now you have bureaucracy, now you have risk, now you have traditional banking, basically. You, now, you, now you're moving towards what traditional banking does much better. They've been doing it, you know, for in some ways for hundreds of years. So we're not going to improve on that. We improve by cutting the Gordian knot and saying we're getting rid of that and doing a, a simple, globally seamless, trust-minimized system. Okay. But to make that scale technologically scalable, you need a layer two solution. You're not going to do that with just layer one. All right. There's going to be so much to unpack here. I want to go back to the start, though. When you first read about and heard about Bitcoin, what were the things that it solved that BitGold hadn't? What, what were the key differences where you're like, ah, oh, that's, that's on the money? Oh, well, the Nakamoto consensus was big. That was a big improvement over okay. I was using Byzantine consensus. Okay. So incorporating the proof of work into the security is a, is a huge thing. And also, I was chatting to Shinobi the other day, and he said one of the actual very key developments in Bitcoin was the difficulty adjustment. Mm. He said that was a, one of the most important developments as well. Yeah, simplifying the money supply. I have a really complicated multi-layer way to get a fungible currency out of what starts out as non-fungible um, proof-of-work solutions in Bitgold. And so he sort of, I, I thought maybe papered that over a little bit, but okay. it's radically simplified. So it's, it turns out to be quite worth it what he did, 
which is to uh, just have this fixed this schedule going up to twenty one million. Uh, were, you, were you going to have a fixed limit in? No, no, no. There was much more complicated. Oh, I don't, I don't okay. know if I can explain it in a <laughs> podcast. It was complicated enough, <laughs> but it involved exchanges and trading and bundling and right, quite a, okay. quite a bit more uh, work needed to be done to get to uh, the money supply. Right. Okay. Were you pissed that BitGold wasn't cited in the white paper? Um, like, it was. On, it man. was. An, it was an auto mission. But, <laughs> yeah. Because there's a ton of parallels. But. Yeah. Because like I was like, come on. Come on. You're taking half the work here. <laughs> All right, so you discovered it. You immediate interest? Did it click straight away, or did you have any doubts? Well, I still shared a fair amount of the pessimism <laughs> that, I'd, that had preventing me from implementing Bitgold in the first place. But I, it, it definitely, uh, once it started catching on, you know, 2009, 10, 11, you know, it caught on with me too. So, And were you contributing to it? Were you getting involved? Were you supporting people? Were you talking to Hal and everyone about it? Um, I yeah, I had some conversations with Hal and some of the others. Yeah, I kind of I'm really jealous of not being around at that time. I wouldn't have been able to contribute because I'm not a coder in any way at all. But it feels like that was a very exciting time mm -hmm. because it, you know, the way I look at it, there was all these projects previously. You know, we had DigiCash and your mm -hmm. project, but this this one has run continuously. It hasn't mm -hmm. stopped. Yeah. So to be part of that and then suddenly realize, holy shit, this really is something. Yeah. Did you have a time where you're like, okay, this really is, was there like a moment where you thought, we're onto something here? This isn't going to get stuck. There were like several of those moments, I All think. right, okay. <laughs> <I> kept building. <laughs> um, I've obviously been exposed to, I talked about Austrian economics as well. Are, are you a fan? Yeah, for the most part. I'm not, like, like, as I was mentioning before, economics like a lot of academic, well, probably like every academic discipline is looking at a particular narrow part of the world. And so, for example, it papers over security issues, generally speaking, it papers over imperfections and huge imperfections quite often, like wars and so forth in the political system that have, for example, a big impact on the history of money, but those tend to be papered over and ignored, including by Austrian economists, but by economists generally. But as far as within the scope of what economics thinks about and buying into the assumptions of economics, Austrians, yeah, do tend to have a better view of that sort of thing. So you would, you kind of prefer that gold standard and you can see a Bitcoin standard. Right. And you prefer this, you know, you're not a fan of, say, inflation and no. Keynesian, like the same guys. No, I mean, for all, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's bad on multiple levels. It's bad because of the trust involved because they change the rules so often. Yeah. I mean, first it was gold, gold coins, and those became too hard to counterfeit. So they went to banknotes, and those are more trust-based. Even coins are somewhat trust-based, but gold banknotes are even more trust-based. And they abuse that trust. They they stop paying on the gold. Yeah. What was an IOU turned into something radical. They didn't change the look and feel of the of the banknote. That still is the same. So everybody thinks they're using the same money, but it's actually radically different. It's fiat currency. It's a radically, completely different thing. A radical experiment as well, right? And it is. Fiat currency is, well, that experiment has been tried several times in history, and the previous times it's failed, or it's been tried, it's failed miserably and caused a lot of problems. John Law, some of the Chinese examples are two of the prominent ones. Assignats during the French Revolution. The currency was issued during the Revolutionary War in America by the Confederacy. And the Revolutionary War is a winning side. Usually the winning side, it doesn't turn out so bad. If you're on the losing side of a war, forget it. Your your currency is destroyed. Your bonds are no good. Yeah, I, I don't understand. People in the financial community, they, have, they just have this very narrow view of like, you know, sovereign bonds, U.S. US bonds are trust, riskless, risk-free bonds. How How is that compatible with the history I've read? The bonds default all the time in history. Well, yeah, I was with Nick Battier the other day, and he was discussing, he said that he was calling bonds a risk-free asset. Uh-huh. This. Well, I, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a bizarre theory to that that papers over the risk by oh, we can just inflate. Yeah. So we'll never default because we can. Well, I mean, Argentina both defaults and inflates both. <laughs> so that does not necessarily. There are limits to how much you can inflate, especially in if your your currency is tradable on you know in the international market. There, you'll be get severely punished for overinflating your currency. So. So if it, if fiat currency keeps failing as an experiment over and over again, and I want to talk pre-Bitcoin as a potential solution, mm -hmm. what other forms of money have existed which which have in the history have been better? 
I mean, is gold better? Well, I, in, I mean, it was, it was more trust minimized, right. but it had a couple some severe flaws. So, so for most of, of, well, shells were a form of collectible and money dating mm-hmm. back, you know, as far as you can long before written records and into the archaeological record and stuff. And, you know, if you dig up some shell that kind of looked like jewelry, what were they using them for? Well, I, and the way I read history, that was kind of the common ancestor of modern jewelry and modern money. There were kind of functions were fused. But, of course, the, the evidence for that is you can only go by the archaeological evidence. Once you get into written records, you see that, for example, silver, basically silver jewelry, was being used to pay legal fines. And you can read in the Old Testament it was being used to pay for real estate deals. Mm-hmm. So silver was in very common use long before coinage was invented. And then gold as an even higher value transactions and wealth transfers. So this stuff dates way, way back. Mm-hmm. If fiat currency keeps failing, I mean, why, uh-huh. why does the experiment con- keep continuing? Is well, it because it, it, it works long enough for, for the cycle of government? I mean, it's tempting to print your own money and have people take it. You can make a profit that way and governments can gain revenue that way and lower their interest rates and arguably be if you're in the middle of a war and you need to win the war, you know, you throw other longer term concerns aside and you print as much money as you can to uh, buy as many weapons as you can and pay as many soldiers as you can. But we're not in a time of war now. So what's going on now? I mean, is, is this more about retaining power? Do you think? That- oh, 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 yeah. I mean, okay, so there's a thing called the Cantillion effect. Yeah. That money doesn't just flow from a helicopter. That's yep. not actually how they do it. It actually goes to specific people. Yeah. Some people get the money and other people don't. And, well, maybe you can tell there's a connection between that and inequality and, and unfairness in the financial system. But, you know, some people are going to get low interest rate loans, like a corporation can go out and get a, you know, a 2 3% loan. But, you know, Joe Blow has to pay 20% on their credit card. So that's a cantillion effect at work. You're either close to the money spigot and you get money out of the money spigot at cheap rates or you're far away from it and you you pay high rates. Would that be different in a free market though? Well, it wouldn't necessarily be equal in, in a free banking system like, like yeah. Selgin and, and uh, White propose. But, you know, once Bitcoin reaches 21 million, that's it. Nobody's getting more money. Yeah. So... Right now, the miners are, are the first in line at Spigot. If you can do a proof of work, then you're first in line at the money Spigot. Right. Okay, one of the interesting things I'd really like to know from you with regard to Bitcoin, before we get into some of the other topics I've got listed, is what are its drawbacks? So, for example, one, one for me, one problem I, just one problem I see with Bitcoin is that it's arguably discriminatory because you need technology for it. And yeah. perhaps in a place like Venezuela, where people want to see Bitcoin as a solution, which it isn't because people, they don't really understand how people are using money. But if you think in terms of Venezuela, they have big power outages. If you have a big power outage and your only wallet is your phone and you can't charge your phone, you essentially don't have money. So there's a couple of drawbacks. The fact that it's, it's entirely technology based right now is a drawback. Right. So yeah, so there is a correlation between... Um financial problems in your country and poor internet access in your country. And yeah. So unfortunately, if you have poor enough internet access, Bitcoin can't help you nearly as much. But the reason I was talking about centralized, uh, digital centralization is it does have one advantage, and that is they can reverse transactions. Yes. I mean, it adds a lot of bureaucracy and, and legal risk and locality to things because it's very becomes more legally vulnerable independent now. But it's also an advantage in that, you know, sometimes... The transaction was wrong. It was extortion. It was some other activity that you want to reverse. I mean, um, and Bitcoin, you can't do that. We decide, okay. You kind of can if the miners collude on a block reward. Well, but they, I mean, they don't though. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've talked about it. They've talked about it. So, yeah. So it would, it would certainly add a huge amount of cost to Bitcoin if that became a practice. And it would take away a lot of the value of Bitcoin. And you're moving in the direction of banking, and why would you want to do that? Banks already do that really well. Do you, do you think in some ways, though, so the, the fact you can't reverse transactions, I think is a positive and a negative. You can see it both ways. You can yeah. see it as a positive because the chargebacks have been a hell of a problem in business, yeah. right? But at the same time, there are times where you probably a some kind of reversal of a transaction is useful. 
Do, is there right, any... but there's a moral hazard problem is that if you can reverse a transaction, then you're sloppier about the transaction. Yes. And we see that with smart pro contract programming too, is that, you know, if you think, you know, if I screw up this enough, it'll, it'll get reversed, then you're going to be a lot sloppier in your, your smart contract programming. And we yep. got a long ways to go before we have good practices in smart contract programming. Yeah. But anyway, there's a moral hazard involved if you know that there's a possibility things can be reversed. There's also risk involved. Political activists can get a hold of that to reverse things that neither of the parties want reversed, but the third party doesn't like. And so there's just a huge amount of costs and risks added when you do that. So Bitcoin is going a different direction, I think a superior direction. It's actually a conservative thing in that it operates like the way money did for 99% of history. The digital centralization is a radical new experiment and Bitcoin is saying, no, we want an alternative to that radical experiment. Yeah, because when it was shells or beads or mm -hmm. necklaces, you couldn't reverse your right, transactions yeah. then. No. There was no central bank then. Correct. Yeah, you know, stupidly, I never thought about that. What is it you don't like about central banking? I bet there's... Uh... Well, I mean, there's a lot of things not to like about it. The Cantillion effect yeah. is certainly it causes a great deal of inequality and unfairness in mm -hmm. our economy, for starters. But there is lots of inequality in any economy. Sure. I mean, that's not the only source of inequality, yeah. but it's a big, very underrated one. Okay. but you. I mean, the just the very creation of money is very asymmetric. Yes. It's not throwing money from a helicopter to everybody or that, that sort of thing. That they yeah, but I also don't think that's something... I know we don't want to get into this kind of area, but it starts down a little bit almost socialist, like... The fair distribution of money, blah blah blah. It's, that's not something. Also, I think you would believe in either. No, no, I, be, I believe in free enterprise. Yeah, but, I, that, but fairness. Uh, but you know, having a government, basically a government monopoly, it's quasi government monopoly right. on on the issuance of money, and then doing it in such a profoundly asymmetric way is not my idea of free enterprise. <laughs> no, no, of course. Okay, so but back to Bitcoin. Any other negatives that you look at, you think? You know, there's so many positives, but anything where you look and think this is a problem. Well, so I mean, the 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 fact that money supply can be changed with a hard fork, you need a very strong anti hard fork ideology of the kind. For example, Greg Maxwell endorses. Do you prescribe to none? Right. It should absolutely be the end of the world as the alternative for your hard fork, really. Yeah. Because. Uh, that that's a line you shouldn't cross because of risk of creating a new coin. Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. I mean, there's a lot of issues with other coins, but that's that's one of them. Is that <laughs> <laughs> is that they don't understand the the high risks and cost of of crossing that line. Well, because something like doesn't is it Monero hard forks every six months or three months or something? I I can't remember, but I heard it regularly hard forks. Yeah, and then I don't know what they're doing, and yeah. so you know, did they change the money supply? Did they do this? Did they do that? I mean, there aren't too many oh. scenarios where you would need a hard fork. It's, it's as much simpler to me if I know, well, they haven't hard forked, therefore I know that there's a bunch of things about it they haven't changed. Yeah. I, I mean, the main potential hard fork for Bitcoin would have been a change in the block size, right? Yeah. Actually, I've, I, I <laughs> so interesting to hear you talk about that. I think it was on the Ferris show where you said the people who are debating it shouldn't be. <laughs> that should be left to the engineers. And yeah, it became yeah, a hotly yeah. discussed debate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... Yeah, because, I mean, there's, I mean, it's like the passengers, you know, debating on how to how to set the flaps on the airplane. <laughs> no, there's things, things that division of labor and expertise and so forth are important for. Yeah. I know it's an old topic, but do you think it'll ever come up again? Or do you think the one megabyte limit is fine? That's a permanent size of the block forever. We can do everything we need in layer two on top of that. Yeah, it's a pretty good... I mean, there's, there's. If I was going to err on the side of changing it, I would err on the side of making it smaller, like Ooh, like Luke. Anyway. But I don't think <laughs> I don't think it's that. You know, I don't think it's that. I think it's pretty close to being right right now. So you would err to smaller, what to become even more decentralized, right? To allow even more full nodes in more places. Yeah, interesting. Luke gets a lot of stick for that. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, he came on the show as well, and he another thing he said to me is something quite interesting. He said he believes that about eighty percent of people should be running full nodes who are using Bitcoin, and we're probably less what less than one percent actually. Do you agree with that? 
No, I think it needs to be a lot of people in a lot of places. So yeah. I would like, you know, and that's another problem with the, the internet connectivity problems in the third world is that it makes it a lot harder to run a full node. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Blockstream Satellite helps there, but then there's another trusted third party involved with that. So that's an imperfect solution. We've got mobile, mobile phones now, the HTC One, is it? Yeah, so it you don't want to make their life harder. Right. I mean, it's not worth a fork to make their life a little bit easier. It's certainly not worth a fork to make their life harder either. Right, okay, okay. Right. But So I guess there's no real scenario like that you consider is worth a fork right now. So we could, could be fine. Um, I mean, there's... There's but certainly potentially ones like quantum resistance, for example. How much of a threat do you think that is, though? I mean, it's 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 largely unknowable. I don't, I don't think it's any sort of imminent threat. There's yeah. a lot of fundamental error things that happen there that they probably won't be able to solve. We got time, but, but it's not impossible. <laughs> we got time. Okay, so with regards to Bitcoin, like you're obviously again, I, I've seen you talking a lot more about Bitcoin online, which is great. Again, I'm very much into trying to talk to wider communities and my friends and people who aren't very technical who don't really think about the money system who who when they come to bitcoin are going to be scared shitless i'm really interested in that what are the things that you think when people the misconceptions people have about bitcoin that you regularly come across um well the the most common one and is that it's a form of retail cash that you know you pay for coffee with and it's you know it's basically paypal but its own currency well, no, every every currency in the world is a multi-layer thing where you have settlement systems uh -huh. and retail payment systems, and they're two different things, at least two different things. There's a lot of other systems, too. And that falls out of the computer science. You can't do everything in one protocol. It's just you can't get combine the security and the throughput and all yeah. that together in one protocol. But the, you know, going back to the white paper, did talk very much about peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. It talked about... You know, problems Lots of white papers have talked oh, all, about all sorts of uh, no, of course, but, things that didn't really turn out. So, but yeah, because you you are, you have these people who say, "Well, this is what Satoshi said," blah blah blah. But I mean, I guess you prescribe to the fact that it doesn't really matter what the white paper says; it's, it matters where people are taking it. Right. So yeah. this is based on computer science. Yeah. So this part of it certainly, I mean, there's an ideological aspect of about trust minimization that is based on some level of belief and a certain point of view. But this part is computer science. Okay. I mean, this part, the computer science tells you what to do, compatible with trust minimization. I mean, you have to have the value, of, bring the value of trust minimization to it. But given that you want to have that trust minimized, censorship resistant, globally seamless layer one, that means you can't do a bunch of other things with layer one. You have to do them with layer two. So, so what about all these other protocols that are trying to do everything on layer one and have big blocks. What is, like, from a computer science angle, what are they getting wrong? What are they not understanding? Well, I mean, the, the trouble is it does work on a small scale. I mean, yeah. you can pay 10,000 Bitcoins for a pizza that, that yeah. worked back in back in the early days, but it doesn't scale. You, you would pay for, you know, a little micropayment today using Bitcoin. Yeah. You can pay for that with Lightning, for example, on layer two. But why not just... Once you're on, you know, you, so anybody can start out and have a little coin that's not used very much, mm -hmm. and there's no problem. The trouble with technological scaling is that once you get bigger, the fees go way up, security can be compromised if you let the transaction throughput go too high, if you, and it becomes centralized. We're seeing that with Ethereum. A lot of it runs yeah. on Infura now. Yeah. Um, well, we'll talk about that as well. So, so, so you don't think we can get to gigameg blocks... No. <laughs> All right. So, so, close to so, that. so, one of the things that I've come to understand is because I, I was wasn't sure on Lightning when I first discovered it, is that the first layer really is about just securing the protocol and securing. It's, it's all about security. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel like we'll get to a point where the base chain will calcify? Yeah, you know, won't have any more updates. Do you think that's a good goal? No, because there's always technological improvements to be had you know okay. Schnorr signatures there's a possible threat from quantum there's okay. all sorts of possibilities where you might want to revise things in the future but certainly they have to be something big to do a fork you're not going yeah, to yeah. do something for just a you know an efficiency improvement or something <laughs> Thank you.
Next up, I talk to Nick more about Bitcoin, but before that, I do have a message from my amazing sponsors. So firstly, let's talk about Kraken, and they had a big announcement this week. I'm not sure if you saw it, but they announced the launch of their mobile app, Kraken Pro, which allows you to trade Bitcoin on the go. Kraken Pro delivers the security and features you love about the Kraken Exchange in a beautiful mobile-first design for advanced crypto trading on the go. They've packed so much in. You've got real-time price updates, multiple charting and order book display options. You've got advanced features such as going long or short on eight different cryptocurrencies with up to 5x with margin trading. You can open and close your positions in bulk with just a few taps and you've got advanced order types. You can also view a complete history of all your orders, trades, position, deposits and withdrawals. And finally, the app comes with a deep and liquid set of 100 cryptocurrency markets, fees as low as 0% and 24-7, 365 global customer support. They have crushed the app like they've crushed everything else. So you really should go and check out the Kraken app. It's available for iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Also, today's show is brought to you by the amazing BlockFi. And as I mentioned recently, I caught up with Zach Prince, the CEO, when I was out in New York. There's some very cool things coming, so I can't wait to update you on that. And also, as the new months have started, that means I've got my interest payment from my BlockFi interest account, which is very cool. It's always very exciting. I do love the fact that my Bitcoin is working for me. And they've had so many cool updates to their interest accounts recently. They've dropped minimum deposits, so interest account holder clients will no longer have to meet a minimum deposit amount in their Bitcoin, Ether, or GUSD balances to earn interest. Additionally, BlockFi has removed the early withdrawal penalty from the account and is now offering one free withdrawal per month to all clients. With BlockFi interest account, you can now earn interest every month on Bitcoin, Ether, and GUSD. So if you're interested in trying this out, I do recommend you do your own research and then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. So looking at where we are with Bitcoin now, it's 11 mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's amazing how far it's come, right? Oh, yeah. Like, are you a little bit surprised? Are you oh, sure? yeah. I mean, because there were so many things failed and it was just our little little brainstorming group on the internet back in the 90s. So. How big can it get now, though? Do you think it's... Do you believe in this kind of hyper-Bitcoinization can now actually happen? Do you, do you see a trajectory where it can happen? It's Yeah, it's a possibility. There's all sorts of, of possibilities that uh, involve lots of messy politics that I couldn't possibly predict. Yeah. So... I mean, I'm really interested in it. One of the things that a lot of people talk about is, oh, mass adoption, mass adoption. And then Nick Carter put out that once he said that mass adoption is not the goal. And I've started to see, again, we talked about this earlier. I talked about the fact that there is a, this school of thought that this is great because anyone who wants censorship resistant money or wants to save and not have their money taken by their government is great. But there is a, this other school of thought that this is a tool to separate money and state and take power away from the government. Do you sit in either camp? Do you have like a preference of it? Well, I don't think you can take all, there's tons of ways government can enforce their laws and collect taxes and, and so forth. So, but they can't put more it, Bitcoin, it, you know, if, if, you know, central banks disappear, that certainly um, reduces revenues. And I think that's largely a good thing because that increases the revenues of everybody else effectively. So in general, that's a good thing. Obviously, there's specific. If you're if you're a government employee or, or a politician who's more enamored with politics and with your constituents' interests, then you're going to be opposed to that kind of thing. Do you think it's possible to wipe out central banks? Well, it's a really long term thing. Yeah. I mean, people talk about Bitcoin having a network effect that locks it in. Well, it doesn't have a strong network effect against altcoins that are as good as Bitcoin. Hardly any of them are, but it doesn't have a strong network effect there as it as fiat, as the major fiat currencies like the US dollar and the euro have. So those have lots of, of lock in effects. So there's, uh, you know, a lot of it just depends on how much rope central banks have. I mean, central banks keep jumping from one experiment to another. And so what they're doing keeps evolving. They're doing negative interest rates now. That's historically unprecedented. Yeah. So they're going into... They don't sound very good. So it does seem central banking and fiat <laughs> currency does seem to be journeying from a historical point of view into ever stranger territory. But how much rope they have left, I don't know. Yeah, I just... It doesn't sound like negative interest rates are a good idea. It sound, That, to me, indicates something severely wrong. You in have the to break system. a lot of expectations and 
probably a few laws too you have to change to get <laughs> to do that. Well, it's good we've got Bitcoin here right now then. Yeah. Yeah. So you've talked a few times during the interview, and I'm going to swing back and forth, I know it, but you've mentioned altcoins. So mm -hmm. you, you certainly don't come across as a maximalist, which is a, a big thing for mm -hmm. people. So how do you feel about altcoins? Obviously, obviously there's a lot of scams and bullshit. Oh, yeah. I don't believe everything that isn't Bitcoin is a scam because I don't believe, I believe some people have honest intentions. I think they just might be stupid ideas. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about, like, firstly, the broad cryptocurrency ecosystem and then specifically what kind of projects are you interested in? Well, I mean, I'd love for the privacy coins to work. So okay. Zcash and Monero and Dash and... There's some good things about those, and then there's some probably not so good things that come from trying to make privacy and integrity work together. Do you have a preference? Like I, I no, I, I don't. I don't have a preference because there's a lot of lot of technicalities that I haven't right. dove into. <laughs> I, I find Monero most interesting. I, mm. I think because it it feels most like Bitcoin. Mm. If you know what I mean, like I think Zcash sometimes feels a little bit like a corporate coin. And Dash has them. Yeah, I mean, there's so many dimensions of these yeah. things. Like, it, probably Zcash is the best technology mm -hmm. of the major privacy coins at this point. But then there's some other things about it that might make you skeptical. So, did you work with Zuko? And, at, did you catch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thought, I didn't work with them there, oh, but okay. we were both there at different times. Oh, right, and okay. then I hung out with them at Cypherpunk's fair amount too. So, oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so what about Ethereum? Because you previously seemed like you were positive about it and then a little bit recently not so much not actually sure if you've uh... well yeah i mean as advertised it had a lot of potential like yeah. the turing complete smart contracting platform being incred is incredibly useful i thought of a ton of useful things to do with it you can't yeah. do with bitcoin but in practice we've seen it centralized we've seen the attitudes of the leadership change yeah lord acton you know have this phrase power corrupts and you could rephrase that as centralization corrupts Interesting. And as, and as uh, you know, a coin becomes centralized, you know, the attitudes of leadership change. It's in their self-interest. They love to talk about game theory and self-interest. Yeah. It's in their self-interest now to preach a pro-centralization ideology <laughs> and kind of cryptically because their followers don't believe that, but kind of cryptically that, that's what they're starting to do. So, Okay. Is there a spectrum of mm. these? Well, no, there is a spectrum of decentralization. I think the goal of decentralization is something you can't turn off right. Mm. Is it possible that Ethereum can be semi-decentralized in that it could have a few nodes operate around the world that means it's very difficult to switch off but still offers benefits to the users? Or is it just the whole idea dead? Well, I mean, the main benefit of it is dead because you could run this centrally like a cloud service and it would have some utility, but it wouldn't be, it'd be very, very different than what Bitcoin's utility is. And it would be very different from what an actual smart, trust-minimized smart contract platform would have. So I wouldn't necessarily say it doesn't have utility. I mean, centralized banking has utility, but its utility is very different than what Bitcoin's utility is. Right, okay. But you yeah. still have an interest in smart contracts. And, and, and the risks are, well, the risks are amplified because okay. bankers know how to do centralized, digital centralized stuff as much as anybody does. Yeah. I'm not convinced the Ethereum people know how to do it. Right. It requires a whole bunch of subtle bureaucracy and subtle things. Um, this whole quagmire about governance. Bankers know how to do governance. Nobody in the crypto space knows how to do governance. So if you see a crypto space, people talking up their governance. I've just, seen you. And you really like that? Just go back to banking. That's what, that's the people who know how to do governance. I saw one of your threads where you were talking about something, and every every time somebody mentioned governance, you say, you bring up governance, I'm going to block you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's there's it's they're like zombies. They're like endless. Okay, but like you have this interest in smart contracts. We can't do Turing complete smart contracts on Bitcoin. Well, one person thinks you can, but we can't, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this interest. Do you think, therefore, that somebody needs to work? So with Bitcoin, Bitcoin, someone has focused on building a monetary protocol. Mm -hmm. And as a group of people, have tried to keep it as decentralized as possible. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's that's an achievable goal with smart contracts? Someone should look to create a smart contract platform, but every design decision, similar to Bitcoin, is aimed at maximum decentralization. Or do you think with smart contracts, it is just not possible because they will always scale to something that becomes centralized? 
Well, it's definitely difficult. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say it's impossible because there's lots of subtleties in the computer science, lots of things remaining to be explored and improved. But, and I can't say I've dove down into, uh, you know, all the different platforms out there that are promising these things. But it's certainly possible, or, well, I th think and hope it's possible, but it, it's harder than, than it looks. Do smart contracts have to be fully decentralized to get the benefit from them? Well, to get the globally seamless trust yeah. organization benefit, yeah. Right, okay. Because otherwise it, it's just going to evolve back into, you know, politically controlled banking. Right, okay. I get, it sounds like you're kind of drifting away from it now as an idea. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunately, yeah, I haven't seen anybody doing it right. I mean, I think Ethereum Classic and RSK probably have a better ethos about it, but whether the technology is up to achieving it, maybe another matter. The one thing I've always felt about with smart contracts is that it goes back to almost that point with being able to reverse transactions. Mm. I've always worried that would companies really adopt smart contracts on immutable ledgers? Mm. <laughs> because if you can't reverse it and there's some bug or mistake that ends up costing, I mean, I, it's no joke to even say tens, even hundreds of millions because that has actually happened in Ethereum. Mm. So I always thought because it's not foolproof, because code has bugs, mm -hmm. do you really want to have smart contracts that business built upon where this could happen? It seems very risky. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you certainly want to have a much more careful. And, and, I mean, part of the reason I'm I'm soured on smart contracts is, like, the standardization of solidity. That's just not a good smart contract language. It's just a normal, basically a normal programming language, roughly speaking. So, I mean, they have better things going on in, uh, and better practices going on with medical devices and airlines. And there are places where people die if your code has bugs in it. And you can't just go upgrade it. It's in hardware or it's in ASIC, for example. Right. So there's lots of places, actually, that are analogous where it's, you know, you program once and it's got to work the first time you you install it in hardware because you're not going to change it, you know, before it breaks and kills somebody. So there's actually a lot of situations like that already. That like a 737 smart max. people can learn. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, well, and they do sometimes kill people. Still. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, you know, and I, I don't think, the, the current smart contracts community has the best practices. I think they can learn from these other areas. See, another thing... They've been doing this a lot longer. I've looked at something like Ethereum. It's like, I mean, to me, it just seems like they're trying to put too much information on the blockchain. If you're trying to put too much information on the blockchain, it centralizes. We know it's centralized around Infura. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a shame that somebody just doesn't stand up and say, you know what? Yeah, we got this wrong. We fucked up. We can't build this. You know, it feels like well, this is the time to have no, there's way too much inertia. I mean, yeah. there's a whole huge culture built up around it now. And uh, a lot of people's wages are dependent on the belief that that stuff works. Just kick the can down the road. Yeah. But the truth is actually free, man. <laughs> like, how long can they continue with this? All right, well, then we should just go back to Bitcoin. Because if none of these are going to work, then... <laughs> well, I, I should say, I'm not, I'm not saying it's all broken or something. I'm just saying that there's a lot of risks involved and... No, I don't think it's suitable for large amounts of money. I would tell and, you. And it's got a lot of risks of centralization. Would, That's all. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, it risks evolving to something a lot more like banking, a lot more bureaucracy and and locality and so forth, than something very different from, from Bitcoin. And then who cares? Okay, so I'm going to go back to Bitcoin. One of the biggest things my friends always say to me is like, it's useless because it's volatile. Then they're mm -hmm. scared to buy it. What they're scared to do is buy it and lose 80%. So... What do you say to people about that? You, you, I mean, I know what you say. You talk about a four-year cycle, right? You, you need to build belief. But do you think this will keep happening? Do you have this fundamental belief it will keep growing? Right. Well, I mean, if you look just at the price and at the history of investments in general, sure, it's a gamble. But yeah. I can understand why a normal Wall Street person would think it's just gambling because um, price only gives you so much information. But if, you know, like me, you've studied the history of money and you realize it solves these historical problems like, Validation has always been a problem. Assaying gold, always, precious metals, always been very expensive. With Bitcoin, you run a full node. Lots of people, not everybody's going to run a full node. Lots of people can run full nodes. And that solves a historically huge problem with money that hasn't been solved in nearly as good a way before. The ability to loot gold, you know, the Aztecs were looted. Well, the Aztecs collected tribute. They looted people. And they were looted by the Spanish. And then the English looted the Spanish. 
you know, it, Nixon it, it, looted it's, the Americans. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it, it was it's not the most secure thing with good key management, multi sig, other techniques that people are developing. And this is a work in progress. Yeah. It isn't necessarily Bitcoin itself, but a work in progress of key management. We can solve a lot of that problem too, as well. So these are historically important problems with money that that Bitcoin is solving or can solve for the first time in history. So, but do you empathize with people who struggle so, with it being not a physical thing? Like uh, I, I, I did, sure. I did with music, right? I was uh-huh. still buying CDs for two years longer than I should have, and now they're all in a cupboard and I don't use them. And I just, you know, mm-hmm. I eventually got the MP3s. It's the same transition. It's the same logical transition in your mind, in that mm-hmm. you're going from a lump of gold or physical notes. Even your debit card feels like money to just numbers well, and math. it feels like money because you started using it as money. And before you started using it money, it didn't feel like money. But it's, it's so different. Bitcoin's so different. When we've spent our whole lives having a belief, which is wrong, but the money has value because of our government, we have that belief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're not all cypherpunks. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, but, you know, everybody can look at a price chart, though. So Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the price chart, it reflects these fundamentals. Now, you can, there's lots of other things, you know, you can look at the price chart. There's, the fundamentals aren't really there and it's a bubble, but I see fundamentals being there. So, Has your opinion drastically changed with any aspects of Bitcoin in its life? Is there any parts of it where you've had a very strong change in opinion? Yeah, I mean, I, I was skeptical of the price schedule at first because it was a very different thing than what I had designed. Okay. But it doesn't seem to have been an issue, so. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing else. Everything else is like. No, I was very happy with the consensus protocols, much better than what I was using, for example. And and how how rigid are you to the rules of Bitcoin? So, for example, if there was a significant block reward, say a thousand block reorg, how would you feel about that? And what do you think the reaction should be to that? Yeah, that would be a huge... Huge deal. That would be a big problem. <laughs> I mean, there's more people down in the technical expertise of, of how pr- likely that is and what you would do to respond to it and stuff than I am. But certainly that would, that's something we would should try to prevent. Yeah. All right. So looking forward, you know, as we said, like we, you know, we'll be coming up to 11 years, actually. See, uh, the white paper actually came out on my birthday. My mm. birthday. Oh, so Halloween. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it came out on my birthday and it came out on my. I mean, I wasn't aware of it because I didn't buy any. I was in. Funny enough, I was in Vegas and on the 10th mm. anniversary, I was in Vegas. So it's just this weird coincidence. Well, it's not actually that weird because it was my 30th and 40th birthday. So where are you going to mm. go on a, yeah. on a big one, right? <laughs> but, you know, we're 10 years in. Where do you see Bitcoin in like five or 10 years? Like in your mind, where? how far do you think we can go with this? Well, I mean, there's a lot of unpredictability, you know, for the first. Uh, many years, you know, government's been very hands off with it, and that's pretty surprising. But it's not too surprising considering how hard it would be to actually effectively crack down on Bitcoin. But seeing how they just went all guns blazing after Libra, yeah, that well, that right there. I mean, but we knew they would do that. They did that against Eagle. Yep. Um, and Liberty Reserve. Right, and Liberty Reserve. Now those are smaller things. Yeah, but. They were certainly also energetic in, in taking them down. And so you can't, I mean, that there's a huge unknown in the politics because the politics so far to Bitcoin has been friendlier than that. And there's various reasons that could be. Part of it is because it is it is very difficult to impossible to regulate at least the core part of it. Yep. It's pretty easy to regulate the exchanges, some other aspects of it. You can regulate but the use. I can't predict politics better than anybody else can. So, but it's quite interesting as well because I watched the the Senate testimony here, and mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be interesting to know what your view on Libra is. I, I mean, I, I didn't hate it as much as everyone else did, right? Like the general consensus. I was kind of like you know, twenty years ago. I, you know, before well, how long has it been? Anyway, before I came up with the gold, and even after, if, you know, that was just still a theoretical possibility. You know, that still would would be a big improvement. Well, I don't know about big improvement. It'd be improvement probably over central bank, the way things are done now. Maybe. Yeah. It, it's certainly a step, but, you know, that's that's 20 years ago. I mean, we've made so many advances that Libra has ignored that yeah. it's preposterous today. But I didn't see Libra as a backward step from fiat. It's a, it was For me, it was kind of like fiat, Libra, Bitcoin. And if it became a bridge right. to introduce people to Bitcoin, I was kind of okay with it. I also felt it was just a natural thing that was going to 
happen. It was it's natural for Facebook to create something like this. Probably, yeah. It, you know, it seemed like a st- stupid thing to fight. And then watching the Senate hearing, it was quite interesting. There's there's some pro Bitcoin senators, and it was mm. quite interesting to hear some of that. I don't know if you noticed some of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Bitcoin is part of the reality now. Yeah. You know, twenty years ago, this is you know preposterously obscure fringe stuff. And now it's very mainstream. It's been all over, you know, the financial net, TV networks and the newspapers and stuff for, you know, for many years now. So that makes a big difference. It's a reality on the ground. And Libra is not a reality on the ground. It was just a proposal. So that was the time they could kill it. Yeah. Well, I think it had come back. So I, I always said, I, I feel it would just be a stable coin. It mm-hmm. would just be a dollar stable coin. Yeah. I mean, it's in competition with Tether and yeah. those things. And, and that's, and it, to be honest, in some ways it made more sense. Seems like a lot easier. I, I think they'll do that. But do you, I mean, interesting thing on the regulation side, do you worry about it? And it, also, is there part of you that actually kind of wants them to bring the fight to you? Is a bit of a cypherpunk? It's like, come on, let's have it. Fuck it, try and take us on. No, I'm enough. <laughs> You've had enough. <laughs> I'm enough of a libertarian to not, no, not want that stuff. It All looks right. like, you know, it it's something Bitcoin can resist, but it's not necessarily something particular people in Bitcoin can resist. Right. Okay. And it could cause a lot of harm. So certainly it's not something I wish for. But on the other hand, we live in a very politically far from ideal world. And, you know, lots of people in government do hate what we're doing and got to be prepared for it. Do you, do you think things are getting better or worse? Because I, I'm definitely, I don't know if it's, I'm noticing it because I'm becoming getting more into Bitcoin and the people I meet, but I'm definitely noticing a growth in libertarianism. But it might just be me spending more time around libertarians. Do you see a time when that will become a viable third political option? I mean, it's come and gone. I mean, there was a big thing with Ron Paul yeah. and so forth, but it doesn't. There's such a interconnection between government and mass media outlets. And uh, there's so many people in other parts of the country that are dependent on it or, you know, their their favorite issue needs government to do it for them. So we need a libertarian news network. <laughs> so, I mean, I think Bitcoin itself, to some small extent, comes with that ethos. There's plenty of people without that ethos, but it may help spread it a little bit. We need a libertarian Roger Ailes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take over a network, mm-hmm. bring Bitcoin to people. Okay, I don't think we fully answered it though. But where where do you see Bitcoin five to ten years? Like your best hope? Where do you think? Well, I, I think what happens is that it moves up out the food chain a little bit. So banks themselves have been very resistant to it so far, but at some point they, they start converting. Probably in less developed countries, the internet connectivity improves in various parts of the world. And internet connectivity may not improve. There may be political barriers to even that. Mm -hmm. But assuming it does, then uh, Bitcoin use in these places is going to improve along with it, and that makes it more viable. And there's a lot more need for it in in various parts of the world than there is in the developed world where most of the people using it are at right now. So I think there's a lot of room for growth there. And in those places, more formal institutions, banks and so forth, are more likely to start using it than they are here. If you're in a wartime situation, like I said, we designed it, BitGold, Bitcoin, B-Money, that whole ethos is designed from the bottom up security and to have it globally seamless and independent. And along with that comes some nice features in wartime. So, for example, you're a central bank in Ukraine. You've got this big pile of gold. You don't want the Russian tanks coming and getting it. Your reserves are much more secure in the form of Bitcoin than they are in the form of gold. So, but that depends on you know, some bad political instability that you cer- we certainly would not wish for. Yeah. Uh, but, but certainly historically is possible. And a shift in mindset to think we want Bitcoin and not gold. And like Bitcoin's still not mainstream enough, certainly at a state level yet. I mean, Right. We- well, some pe- people have to be hit in the head with reality. I mean, if you're censored by a bank, as people increasingly are, and by the way, that's one of the risks of digital centralization is people get censored. And the active, the political activists from various points of view are starting to discover that you can go to banks and get your political enemy shut down. And people doing things you don't want them to be shut down. You don't necessarily need to pass a law. You know, you can convince some regulators or convince some politicians and then they lean on the banks 
and boom, that's your de facto law right there. And that's increasingly happening because digital centralization makes things so vulnerable to that. Yeah. So that's another trend, and it depends how fast that grows. Because every time somebody gets censored, boom, that's a reality over the head. They become a Bitcoin fan. Yeah. I mean, if you met Andrew Torba from Gab.com. I have not met him, but I have read of what he's gone through. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, they switched off everything. Mm, yeah. And it happened very quickly, mm. almost to the point of coordination between mm-hmm. all the groups. So interestingly, I've come across a few people because of this, and this is why I'm doing this other show as well, because I want to touch on this. But uh, yeah, I mean, they lost every single platform, mm. and they went to Bitcoin, and now he's a huge Bitcoin fan because of this. Mm. Yeah. Probably very simple, similar to what happened with WikiLeaks, right? Right, yep. Yeah, but also I actually had it when I was talking to a sex worker. She <laughs> she got debanked. She got kicked off PayPal. She actually got deplatformed by Coinbase as well. Mm-hmm. So she had to she had to independently accept Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean those are the those are the real world cases. It won't be political ideology so much as many cases from many political different points of view like that 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 uh, cause people to switch to Bitcoin or at least to consider it. Yeah, I do wonder if any governments are. Well, we know of some. Well, so. I mean, for example, a war would be yeah. hit, is the version of a government being hit over the head. Um, sanctions yeah. might be another example. And that's starting to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So we're hearing, I think, is it five countries? So we know of North Korea, of course. Mm-hmm. We've heard of Venezuela stealing mining equipment and also using it to get around sanctions. I think mm-hmm. Iran, Syria, and there's probably one more. I wouldn't be surprised if Russia use, Russia uses it, so perhaps they are already using it. Perhaps mm-hmm. it is already existing because sanctions are state level censorship, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. I mean, yeah, well, and it shows the why governments also would be motivated to, you know, shut it down or try to come after it in some way. So, on the one hand, it, that motivates people to use Bitcoin, and on the other hand, it increases the risks involved. So, we live in really, really fucking strange times right now. Oh, yeah. I don't know if, if you're oh, feeling yeah. it. Oh yes. <laughs> um, Oh, well, I mean, our society is running so many radical experiments in parallel. Yeah. And uh, we're just kind of hurtling into the future, mostly blind. Everybody thinks they know what's going on or pretends they know, but and basically we're going b- blindly into the future. And everyone's pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone's angry, like I'm fighting. One of the things I'm looking at quite a bit, and I mentioned to you before, it's like I'm just looking at global warming as an issue. And this is more just to explain my problem. It's not whether global warming is an issue or isn't an issue. I can't find any truth. Uh, I'll, I'll go one side and a bunch of people say, oh, here's some science information. You're wrong. You're a fucking idiot. And then I'll go to the other side and I get exactly the same. And I'm finding that on multiple topics, whether it's global warming, gun rights, sex worker rights, abortion, any of these very complicated issues, yeah. there's no middle ground. Everyone's just like, Rrr! Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the more complicated things get, the more you, people oversimplify because we have finite brains. And so... But the internet has allowed people to find each other, yeah, find a voice. And people convince themselves that they understand things that they don't yeah yeah well i'm guilty of that as well to be honest Nick. oh it's universal yeah yeah it's, it's really hard to kind of take a step back sometimes and just say well hold on i'm get a bit too confident of myself we're like yeah where's where's my area but it's really really strange times it's, and it's really interesting i mean we're watching the nature of money change in front of us right mm-hmm. we are watching very different political outlook i know you're a obviously i am aware you're a fan of trump i've certainly had my opinion change of him not a fan but i've had my opinion mm-hmm. change of him we've got brexit in the uk i mean mm-hmm. what what do you make of everything that's going on well again it's, it's far too complicated to be able to understand and predict more than a fraction of it i mean one of the interesting patterns that's common to hong kong and brexit yep. that i find interesting from my legal studies is that it's common law versus civil law okay so brexit england they invented the common law tradition very ancient tradition there but europe is a civil law roman law tradition and that has come into pretty severe conflict and that's a big part of the motivator for brexit the legal brexit has at least the the uh, tacit support of most of the lawyers in britain because that's what they learned is the common law and they don't want a bunch of people from an alien legal system coming and telling them how to do things yeah and that erupts just all over in politics and the legal system and stuff but it's also the same in hong kong they have the british common law tradition and then china borrowed their law from germany which is a civil law tradition 
And so that's actually, in, at certain levels, the same kind of conflict as Brexit. And so I, I see some patterns like that that are interesting, but I can't claim, you know, the, the, the world of politics is so complicated, I'm not going to claim some great ability to predict these things. Well, no, uh, but when you talk about patterns, I mean, this is it this week we've had demonstrations in Barcelona, Lebanon, is it? Chile. Yeah. I mean, it just feels like across the world now, everyone is starting... It's almost like... It almost feels like to me as if Hong Kong has said to people, you can fight back. Uh -huh. You don't have to take the bureaucracy and the bullshit. Do uh -huh. you get that feeling? I guess, but I'm not there. Yeah. And I don't know. I, my, my, my father fought the Hungarian Revolution, which was somewhat at least tacitly encouraged by the United States. And for some reason, Hungarians believed that the United States might come help them. And of course, we weren't really in a... United States wasn't really in a position to help Hungary. And so that, that was a lost cause. They The tank Russian tanks came in. And and so, I mean, that's success in my personal history. I sort mm. of see Hong Kong through that lens. And, you know, we can all say we support them and all this, but... Can we, how would we actually possibly help them without risking nuclear war? Well, exactly, yeah. So I, I, I do where, wonder where they're getting their mojo and motivation from to fight what seems to me like a lost cause. But it's cool that they all are. power to them, whatever yeah. power they can get. Isn't there like a – didn't I read at the moment there's a, the current president of Hungary is not a good dude? Like he's – no, Taking well, those back? okay. So this is a similar issue to the Trump issue. Oh, tell me, because I don't know. I only okay. read about it recently. Okay, so there's tons of people that that hate nationalism, basically. Yeah. Well, it's you get shamed. So hate... It's a shame yeah. thing, right? Like, well, if it's... I went back to the UK now and I said, oh, like I'm pro Brexit, and uh -huh. a lot of my friends hate me for it, <laughs> uh -huh. and I've learned more about Trump here. I'm, again, I'm not a fan, but I've learned more about uh -huh. him. And I know if I express that amongst certain groups, back friends back at home, they're going mm -hmm. they're going to shame on me and treat mm -hmm. me like I'm a Nazi. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's put it let's this way. So, so I have a fondness for Hungary and Hungarian culture, partly because my father was close to it, but he lost it. Yeah, he, he did not teach us Hungarian, and so there was a little genocide going on there. Insofar as that that now that language is very rare. It's a non-Indo-European language. It's Distantly related to Finnish, probably. Distantly related to some languages in Siberia, which have already basically died out. And so it's a very unique culture and a unique language. And it would be, an, I, I don't know, I would think from just an objective point of view, my view's not objective because I, you know, my, my dad's Hungarian. But I would think just from an objective point of view, it would be a great loss for humanity to lose this culture. But that's what you do. If you invite a bunch of people in who don't share the religion, don't share the the race, don't share the language, especially, you're gonna lose that culture. You know, there's there's no reason for people to learn Hungarian in Hungary, except that their neighbors speak it. If their neighbors aren't speaking it anymore, they'll lose their culture. So if you care about preserving culture, as a lot of Hungarians do, as the Hungarian president does, then I would think the current you know, immigration restrictionist Hungarian culture is a very good idea. Okay, interesting. But that's very different from the American point of view, kind of multi-ethnic, multilingual, everybody's welcome kind of thing, and, you know, more diverse, the better. All right, interesting. I'll have to read a bit more about that then. Okay, interesting. All right, well, listen, look, one thing I want to finish on with you, I got into a debate this week with somebody relating to... Bitcoin SV, and they, what they were talking to me about is Moore's Law again. And I've heard mm -hmm. Moore's Law come up, and people mm -hmm. talk about big big plots don't matter because we have Moore's Law. But then I was reading about the Moore's Law isn't eternal. There is right. Well, there's a fundamental limit in physics yeah. called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Yeah. That sets a limit. Uh, this is a good thing to finish on. It's it's one of these very unfortunate things in physics, like Einstein's limit to the speed of light limit, that was really awful. <laughs> And it's a, it's even more awful than the speed of light limit. It's it's a limit on how precise you can make things. And almost every technological breakthrough in human history, from the industrial revolution to uh, you know computers, semiconductors, has been based on making things more precise. Okay. But unfortunately, the smaller you go in scale, the more things get funny and imprecise relative to your scale. Okay. So that's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So now Feynman wrote an essay I think in the 1940s called Plenty of Room at the Bottom where he said, yeah, there's Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but it's a long way away from here. We've got a lot of improvement. And lo and behold, we did have a lot of improvement. Moore's Law, you know, this exponential mm -hmm. increase in precision and speed and transistors and so forth. 
But that is coming to an end. Right now, sadly, we're, we are reaching Heisenberg's limit, at least as far as semiconductor technology is going. Um, I just bought a new Mac recently, and uh-huh. it's basically the same as the Mac I bought in 2015. <laughs> Costs the same, <laughs> has the same capabilities. That's never happened before in my life. Right. And that's because, you know, we're reaching physics limits. And that's happening now. It's not like it's going to come to an end. It is coming to an end. What's the implication? Well, the implication is, for example, during the block size debate, people were saying, oh, Moore's Law, so we can expect, you know, X percent improvement in this, Y percent improvement in Y. These turns out to be very over-optimistic and, okay. and to project that kind of thing in the future. It's much more likely to be flat. Now, there is somewhat orthogonal directions things might go, like quantum computing, but like the traditional semiconductor classical computing certainly has reached an impasse right now. And uh, maybe there's some room for improvement still. Maybe there's not much, but it's, you know, the next hundred years, as far as you can, is the laws of physics. We don't discover something new in physics. Yeah, we're, we live through an era, just like the Industrial Revolution and transportation, people lived through the era where, you know, when people are going to space in the 1960s, we thought, oh, you know, transportation, the speed people are traveling is increasing at this exponential rate. Right. And so we'll be zipping at light speed through the universe in a, you know, in a few decades. Yeah, never well, no, no. There's actually physical limit. And there's actually this huge gravity well we live on. Yeah. And no, we don't have these space colonies and flying cars and all that stuff people thought because there were there's physics limits to these things um, and practical limits that, that people haven't figured out how to get around. And so we're reaching that probably with with computation right now and it's going to be a lot more boring and sad in terms of than i've experienced in my lifetime right so so we're going to hit a plateau in technology advancements unless what it would require you're saying there's quite new physics or just maybe different chip design yeah, new physics, like well oh. i mean n- quantum computing is not new physics but it's a new application of quantum computing that that finds a new set of parallelisms that aren't available in classical computing how much have you looked into quantum? I'm assuming you have, of course. Uh, a but, little bit, but, but uh, it's, a, it's, you know, like any of these things, it's a very detailed esoteric thing that uh, I, I'm not possibly an expert on, like the experts in the field. But it does have a lot of barriers in terms of noise and error that uh, may or may not ever be overcome. So, so if we're going to have a boring next... 40, 50 years. Well, the rest I, of the I think, I th- <laughs> yeah, I think the, the really exciting progress in my life was computation and software is eating the world. Now, there's a lot of improvement left in software because we have this bloatware that came up. Like every time mm-hmm. Moore's Law, you know, doubled the speed of something, Microsoft and other companies were right there to, you know, to completely obliterate that advantage with bloatware. Yeah. <laughs> so there's all sorts of inefficiencies in software that, that probably can be overcome. But, and that'll be probably a more important source of efficiency improvement over the next hundred years than hardware. Yeah, I mean, maybe we don't need hardware. You know, we used to talk about software eating the world. Bitcoin eating the world would be a very exciting thing because that yeah. would be a very significant change to society, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe that's uh, the next advance. Well, eating the financial system, maybe. Eating the financial system. Yeah. Can it do anything else? Is there anything else in there that, that interests you? Rolled up to work. Like in, in like in Bitcoin. So, for example, identity. Do you find that an interesting? Oh area? no, I mean Bitcoin goes in the opposite direction. Right. It, it doesn't depend on any identity. It doesn't need it. Doesn't implement it. But people um, are building. It, it identity. avoids it because it's a it's a tar baby. It's a, a terrible quagmire to get into. But people are building identity into. Right, because that's the traditional banking system requires identity. <laughs> and so people come with the traditional banking mindset, oh, you got to have identity. Well, no, actually, in Bitcoin, you don't have identity. That's one of the brilliant efficiency wins of it is that whole human quagmire and bureaucratic mess you don't need. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the only other big area of interesting tech that a lot of people seem to be interested in is AI and the implications and automation. and. Mm-hmm. That's a large, basically, software unknown, like how does our mind work? How much can we implement in that software? Now, there were projections about Moore's Law that computers would reach human capacity, although the comparisons are actually quite dubious because they work quite differently. Right. We're going to fall short of those because Moore's Law is, is not going to keep up with those projections anymore. So that kind of sheer hardware capacity <clears throat> thing is going to stop somewhat short of human capacity. 
So um, it, but we don't know how intelligence works and, and the mind works for the most part. <laughs> and so it's anybody's <laughs> guess as to whether this lesser, what was deemed a lesser computational capability that we are going to probably plateau at will be sufficient for, for human-level AI. And then, of course, because software can already do a bunch of things much better than humans, you know, it'll if it can do what we can do as good as us, then, of course, it's better than us. So. It'll get rid of us. That, that's, yeah. It won't need us. Yeah. <laughs> so so ter uh, terminated can happen. So, I mean, but but again, that's that's a big unknown because we don't really know how the mind works yeah. for the most part. So Yeah. Are you interested in the AI? And do you share any of the fears about no, it? No, it's mostly marketing hype. It's like right. what I will hear about AI just on Twitter or so forth is what, you know, other people hear about blockchain on Twitter. It's like, it's not reality. <laughs> <laughs> the blockchain myth. Yeah. What uh, what does excite you then? What, what are the things like you're thinking about outside of Bitcoin? I know you love Bitcoin, come on. Mm -hmm. But what other things are exciting you about you, you, that are worth investing your time into? Uh, well, I, I study a lot of history to stay grounded on that. Yeah. I, prior to Bitcoin, I was interested in other things like space development. I worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I was oh, yeah? all excited to see the tail first rocket SpaceX thing. That's a nice breakthrough in that. So I was reading yeah, about a interesting um, thing. So have you, look, you read into the scramjet? Uh, I haven't heard about advances in that recently. So I was, it was in the news yesterday that a jet that could get you from the UK to Australia in four hours. Yeah, if they can get that to work, I mean. They've been trying to get it work for decades, so yeah, whether they can get to work or not, I don't know. But I mean, they they do it. They do use it in missiles and so forth, right? But, but there are some barriers and limits to it. Not the least of which is this, the thing that killed the Concorde was supersonic booms and nasty, loud things like that. Yeah, it's good. That, that was interesting about Concorde. I, I watched a documentary about that the other day, mm -hmm. and the fact that we've not had another supersonic jet since. Mm -hmm. But the sonic boom, you couldn't do it over certain cities, right? It had to be right. over the sea. Right. Yeah, and they consume more fuel, which in our area of concern about global warming is the opposite direction of where most people want to go. So Doesn't the scramjet not consume traditional fuel, doesn't it? Like, no, it has to burn fuel. I thought it had to like it burn oxygen as well, though, or something. Well, oh, all jet engines do. Yeah. At a certain speed, though, like it was, it would be more efficient than a traditional engine. I mean, it might be more efficient. Yeah, yeah. So you don't think we're going to be colonizing Mars? No, I mean that's a huge quagmire. If you study how economies work and how complicated they have to be just to support really simple things, there's a uh, for people who think that kind of thing is simple. There's a essay out there called I Pencil that okay. goes into detail about how complicated and how many people are involved directly and indirectly. Yeah necessary to just create a simple little yeah. pencil. Yeah. There, there's not one person who knows how to create a pencil. Right? right, exactly. Yeah, I heard about that. Unless they, you know, spend 10 days whittling one pencil or something very inefficient like that. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, I I, yeah, I don't see it as uh, something in my lifetime anyway. Uh, Nick, look, this has been fantastic. Really, really appreciate your time. I hope you don't do another interview now for a couple of years. And, and when you do, it's, <laughs> it's me again. No, look, I really appreciate it. People are going to love this. It's a real honor for me to have you on the show. You can finish up. Tell people where they can read your work and follow you. Um, so I'm at my blogs at unenumerated.blogspot.com. Well, that's old stuff. I don't update that very often these days. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Nick Sabo Four. All right, cool. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks. All right. So how was that, Nick Sabo on the show? Right. <laughs> pretty cool oh wow okay so that was a real peak moment in doing the podcast for me nick was really great to chat to and definitely definitely a highlight for me over this last two years i think sometimes he could come across a bit grumpy online but in person he was just the nicest friendliest guy really easy to talk to and yeah it was really easy to make the show his insights into those early days of the cypherpunks makes me quite jealous. I'd love to have been around. I'm probably not the right personality for it, but just to have been around and see what's happened, it must have been very, very cool. Very interesting to be involved with all those people. So this was definitely one of my hardest interviews to acquire. So a big thank you to a few people who helped me make this happen. I'm not going to name you because I don't want people bugging you, but thank you. You know who you are. And also, thanks for listening as always. If you've got any feedback, you know as ever, you can reach out to me. It's hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And to everyone who supports the show, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you do want to support what I do, just head over to my website. It's whatbitcoindid.com. Click on the support section. Whether you leave a review, whether you want to become a sponsor, whatever you want to do, just head over there. 
Okay, as I mentioned, I'm back off to Bedford today and then hopefully going to be heading back out to the States in the next couple of weeks. Lots and lots more interviews planned and maybe with trips to Hawaii and New Zealand. We will see. All right, have a great weekend and I'll see you soon.